Hello everyone and welcome to Pushing Positivity on the Pier, where we introduce amazing people, take a deeper look into their story, and share how they're making positivity actionable each day. I'm Josh Schiller and today we are joined by Adam San Miguel, an avid salsa dancer, a CrossFit enthusiast, an account manager at Dell Enterprises, yep. and also the founder of Calle, the Cuban American Alliance for Leadership and Education. God. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. How you doing? That's a very energetic intro, and I love it. I mean, that, that's your story. You pronounce your pronunciation it's... actionable. I love it. <laughs> so our long history of friendship, right? Very long. Let's, let's talk Jesus. about this. How many decades ago back? Lineage. Lineage. Um, <laughs> So, Africa. Yep. Went there for a mutual friend's wedding, Justin Nwange, and we connected there. What was it about that trip for you uh, that was was so impactful? So I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of that trip and a lot of Joe going to be sprinkled into this conversation um, because really it goes it goes way before that trip for me in terms of what I drew from Joe himself. As you mentioned, we were, we were there for a mutual friend's wedding. Joe and Mwange, Joe wish you were here. I think he's on his honeymoon. Coming I think back. he got back. I think he got back. Anyway, we love you, brother. Um, so, and I'll highlight two of the things that I took from Joe and then how that trip was just, a, for me, a physical manifestation of actually seeing him play it out. But um, two things I get from Joe and Mwange. The first is, his, is how, he, how he appreciates his own culture. Joe's Kenyan-American. Um, and ever since I met him back in, in oh, well, I met him, I knew him for, for many years, but since we officially started, uh, you know, our, our, our adult relationship, if you will, as, as professionals, was around 2010. And Joe always expressed uh, and manifested an appreciation for his culture, him being Kenyan American. He would take yearly trips to Kenya. Um, he took on volunteer activities in Kenya. Um, he truly tried to embody a lot of what his parents passed down from him, um, from them being born in Kenya, him being first generation Kenyan American born here. Um, so that's the first lesson and sort of uh, life mission that I've embodied from him. The second is Joe's a very philanthropic person. He's very, he gives back to the community. He's, he's big into charity. Um, and he has that, that, that philanthropic side to him. Um, and so those are the two things, the two of the many things I take from Joe or I strive to take from Joe. Those are the two main pillars that I can highlight here. And going back to your question about the trip, both of those were sort of manifested in that trip, right? Number one, he got married in Kenya, so he brought all his friends and family to Kenya, to Nairobi, the city city, feel the city, feel the culture, um, experience the people, experience the, the wildlife, everything the culture has to offer. That was the first part. And then he also uh, gave us the opportunity to go visit the orphanage that he has, in, in, quote, on, uh, in quotes, um, adopted as his own, right? So his mission when he goes there, he contributes, uh, helps the children, gives them uniforms, gets companies to get involved and, and finds different ways to help that institution that's, that's um, I think motherly care is what it was called, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so those are the two things I take from Joe that we saw play out in our week long trip to Africa, which was just beautiful, right? Experiencing the culture and experiencing uh, sort of a give back mini project inserted into that week long uh, festivity of, of, of celebrating a wedding. So for me, it was impactful to see sort of Joe's home turf, right? Things that I've pulled from him over the years to seeing it, it live, you know, seeing him interact with his culture, seeing him sort of going through Nairobi and knowing the ins and outs and the culture and the animals and the, and the, and the Maasai tribe and little details that you can just tell he, he embodied. It wasn't, from there. he wasn't a tourist, you sure. know I mean? He was kind of like there, but not, it, it was this cool dynamic. And then obviously you felt being the orphanage, that was probably the most, aside from the lion attack that we watched. It was, um, that, it was that dramatic too. It was, it was like that. But besides that, the orphanage was for me that was the most impactful thing. You kind of walk away with a level set of, of new humility, right? So it's, it's very interesting to hear you talk about Joe and his roots or, or his connection back to Kenya. And I think there's a, there's a parallel there that I picked up immediately on. And that same kind of connection and tie that, and that, and that pride that Joe has for Africa and Kenya specifically, just going out on a limb here, but I believe you probably have that same tie to Cuba. Yep. So being a Cuban American, let's take a couple steps back and let's just talk about maybe growing up and where some of those roots come from. Obviously you have Cuban lineage and can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so my grandparents, were, all four of them were born in Cuba. Uh, my parents were both born in Cuba. 
Um, they came in the late 60s, early 70s uh, to this country as, as sort of like the first or second wave of, of Cubans that left uh, Cuba after uh, Fidel Castro's revolution um, triumphed in Cuba. And uh, this area in particular, so a little bit north of where we are right now, we're in Hoboken, I'm, I'm sure your, your crowd is aware of that. Um, a little bit further north of Hoboken is a series of uh, a couple cities, so Union City, West New York, North Bergen. There was a big settlement of Cuban, uh, Cubans in that area, apart from Miami. And so, you know, I kind of grew up in that area of a very Hispanic area, very Cuban area, um, sort of living Cuba, Latin America through my parents, through the community, um, feeling the, uh, the, the yearning for their country, you know, decade after decade, uh, year after year, through my grandparents and through my parents. Um, and so we're both very American now at this point, both very Cuban at the same time. Um, going through that exile experience, you know, you, you sort of have a different outlook on your home country, which is sort of, you know, there's differences and there's similarities. This is one of the differences, something almost not unique to Cuba, but unique to any country where you've been sort of a political refugee, where you've been sort of an exile uh, to another country, and just the, the perspective that you have towards that the home country just changes a little bit, right? When when things are taken from you and, and political situations force you to leave, it's different than you just saying, you know, I'm looking for a better opportunity, I'm gonna to go to the United States, right? So it's just a different different experience and, and so I think there's a different sort of yearning and longing always for that homeland. Um, and, and so that's marked me uh, significantly in my life and I, I truly didn't feel that um, that weight or that marking on me until probably my grandparents started to pass away, right? So my first grandfather passed away when I was like 12, 13, second one when I was like 17, 18, and then my grandmother when I was like 21-ish. So in that late teens to early 20s is when I really feel, started to feel the lack of their presence, right? There was just, you know, the family party dynamic started to change a little bit. There was less Spanish talk, there was less talk of Cuba, there was just less of those strong emotions just because you know, the, the, the bearers of that, the true bearers were, were the grandparents. Right? My parents came as children, so they, they felt that and they lived that. But, you know, when you come as a young, as a, as a, as a mature adult, as a 40-year-old person, after having built a life somewhere else, to have that ripped away and having to kind of start all over again, um, you know, that started to go away. And that's kind of when I started to say, wait a minute, you know, who, who am I? What's my last name? What was this all, all this Cuban stuff that we used to talk about and all these events that used to happen in Mariel? Uh, Elian Gonzalez, everything that we used to like sort of monitor as a family of things that used to be like the talk of, sure. of the household sort of started to dissipate. And then that's when I kind of really started this, um, this journey of, of, of rediscovering that aspect of my life that for a long time, you know, it's the last thing I wanted to hear about. I was very into sports as, as a young kid and the last thing, I was very active. So the last thing I wanted to do was just sit in like a living room with like an, a 75 year old Cuban, you know, talking about the days when, you know, he used to climb Umada de Mango and take out, you know, aguacate and mangoes and all his childhood dreams. I'm like, I'm, uh, memories, I'm like, let me get out of here. I want to go play baseball, football, basketball. Um, so, so that's when I started, you know, reliving that journey of, of, of who my parents and who my grandparents uh, were, you know, in terms of their background and their culture and their heritage. And I think, you know, it's one of those things where growing up, there's so many things to, to worry about. And, you know, we take for granted sometimes, especially um, some of the older people in, in our family and the experiences that they've actually went through and the rich culture that they have, whether it be in the form of song, whether it be in the form of stories, there's definitely something to be said about that, that passion that they hold for history. Right. Now, you mentioned sports. Now, we've had previous conversations before that you draw a lot of your discipline and a lot of just your work ethic from your experience with sports so were you, you football correct yep and where'd you play so I played you know, growing up I think everyone plays all sports right so I played football baseball basketball the one that I took past high school was football so I played in college football at Monmouth University and what was that experience like um, so so it marked my life it's part of who I am. Um, it's it's definitely in my DNA. You know, after so many years of going through the the process of being an athlete, a serious athlete, and and collegiate, and and trying to go pro after college, I was at that point where, um, you know, as a as an amateur athlete trying to turn professional. So I was going through that, those rigors of training, and and looking back on that whole entire journey from you know Pop Warner um, up until you know trying out, working out with with various teams, both. Uh, all three in NFL, AFL, 
uh, in CFL, so Canadian football, arena football, and obviously National Football League in the U.S. It was a tough transition after, and so there was a period of about a year or two where it's like, kind of like, now what do I do? You know, because sure. everything I did revolved around, yeah. revolved around that, and so, you know, right around 24, 25 years old is when I started to, to, to sort of make that transition effectively and, and pulling a lot of those life lessons. And what you find is um, everything you did to be successful in a sport, football, in my case, all you have to do is repeat that and apply those same underlying principles to anything in life, and, and it's almost a way to guarantee your success in anything you do. Um, and so, yeah, to your point about the discipline and, and the work ethic and the desire and the ability to sacrifice, um, and even, even more intricate things like watching film and how to translate the aspect of watching yourself on film into a professional setting. It's easy to conceptualize, oh, I play a game, I go watch the film to see where my mistakes were in that game, right? How do you translate that aspect into life, into a professional meeting? Preparation, right? Correct. Into a meeting, into a, a speech, into an interview, into a conversation, into networking. How do you take that concept of watching film? Is there always a film on? If there is, watch it. If not, are you reflecting, right? Can you self, can you meditate, reflect, and almost feel the conversations you've had see mistakes and correct it. That right? comes with a certain level of awareness, right? Correct. So, you know, here on Push Positivity on the Pier, and High Fiver in general, we're really about taking these concepts that are all great concepts, hard work, uh, work ethic, discipline, uh, preparation. As ideologies, that's what we strive for, right? But in terms of making them actionable. So let's talk about that transition period, because I think that's, that's usually a period that it's probably hardest for most people, whether they're transitioning from job to job, whether they're transitioning from career to passion or from sports to workforce, right? What is some actionable advice that you could give to people that may be transitioning from, let's say, a sports dream or something that they were going for or something along those lines and now actually having to pivot into the workforce? What, what were some of the things that helped you along that journey? Um, so I have, a, I have a, like a methodology behind it, and I'll, I'll explain it. But, but first, you mentioned the positivity movement. You mentioned you know, what your, the high fiber movement is, and I don't, I don't want to overlook that and make it all about me. I want to make sure that um, your effort is recognized, at least on this version of the episode. Um, I think what you're doing is, is fantastic. I think there's enough negativity and enough mediocrity out there that someone taking an hour, two hours, or 10 minutes every day, literally every single day, to make sure that they're doing their part pushing that out is admirable for me and I respect you a lot for it. So so thank you for including me in it, but thank you for the work. I think there are a lot of people who are gonna benefit from that long term. And I'd encourage you to stay persistent even when there might be a day or two when you're like, what do I, you know, what, do I, what the hell am I doing? So thank you. Um, thank you. To that. your question, yeah, it's just true. Uh, to your question about the transition and sort of um, how to go about it. So even before that, I'd say make sure it's the right time. For me, I, I truly think, not that I had some dream to be, you know, a 10-time All-Pro uh, athlete in, you know, for the Giants or something like this, but I, I truly think that if I would have gave it a little bit more time and actually um, blocked out a lot of the noise and the naysayers who were saying, you know, get a job, what are you doing, this and that, that I think there would have been a short stint where I, I would have been signed professional athlete somewhere, CFL, AFL, bouncing around the NFL leagues, who knows. So I'd say make sure, calculate the move right and make sure that you're not leaving something on the table. That How do you know it's the right time though? <sighs> I don't know, there, there's no formula for that one, but I just know in my case personally. Was there a defining moment there? Was there I, I just gave it a year, and that's not enough to give to something you care that much about. I said, I'm gonna finish school, I'm gonna give a full year, I'm gonna go to all these tryouts, and if nothing comes for them, I'm gonna get a job, right? Because I come from, like I said, an immigrant family, working class family, you know, there wasn't a lot of years that I could do where I was living on my parents' couch and just working out every day, right? Going to the track in the morning, lifting in the afternoon, ball drills, you know, running my routes in the, in, in the late afternoon. There's only so much of that I can do when, when my parents just couldn't conceptualize, like, what, wait, what is my son? You have a degree? You're one of the first people in the family to have a degree, and what are you, you're just going to the park right now? Uh, it, so, and so that, and so I let a lot, of, not that it's negative, but that's, that's their reality, that's how they perceive it. So I let a lot of that into mind. I'm like, you know what, it's true, I have to use it. I, I have, I'm smart, I have a degree, I gotta go. And so, you know, I let that little bit guide my decision as opposed to putting my head down and saying, this is exactly what I want to do and execute on. Again, not for 20 years, but year two, three, four, who knows what would have happened if I just would have stuck it out a little bit more. Um, 
and maybe nothing would have happened. Who knows? But I know I, I probably looking back now, I think I owed myself more than, you know, nine to 12 months of trying. So I don't know, to your question, Josh, when the right time is, but just if it's something that you care that much about, I, I would just make sure that you've thought it through, what the implications are. So, well, because that, that's the other thing too, is like, you know, you, you bring up the, the pressure from parents, right? And yeah. a lot of times people that are in our life that are the, the closest to us don't always support, right, that dream that we may have because their experiences, they may not, like you said, conceptualize what it actually means to, you got a degree and what do you mean you're, you're, you're playing football, right? So. I guess how how do how do you think people can control that noise, right? And and when do they take it as something? Is it ever, or is it something that you kind of have to gauge for yourself? So I think it's a it's it's a it's a gut thing, and when you listen to your gut and you trust your gut and you actually practice raising the volume on that gut on a day to day basis then the decision becomes easier and easier. It's when little by little you start lowering the volume on that gut, um, like I, w which was my case, then you start seeing things some, the way someone else does, which is not always a bad thing. But in that particular case, when we're talking about uh, a specific window of time that you have in your life to pursue an athletic endeavor, um, for the most part, right? You can, I could put the cleats back on and, and make a run at it now, right? Would it be as effective as if when I was coming out of college? Probably not. So I say window of time in that aspect, right? So you have a certain window of time to execute on it or at least try and execute on it. Um, and I truly think I should have given a little bit more time. Um, there's no general guideline because there's different scenarios and those different scenarios have different parameters and intricacies that I can't speak to. But for me, that one has a certain window of time where you had to go big or go home. And I only did it for a short period of time where I should have doubled down on it. Um, I, I like what you said about raise the level of the gut. And that's kind of like raise your inner voice, right? True. Uh, you exactly. got to listen to that, right? And that's, that's something that regardless of what people say around you, it's my belief that that inner voice is really that beacon or that, that flashing that's like, this is, this is where you, right, internal self here, we're talking about, that's the direction that you want to go. But a lot of times we let other, others' voices kind of extinguish that yep. voice. Yep. So I guess the takeaway here is, you know, if you feel it and if it's something you, you truly, truly believe in, you know, you have to fight for that voice. You have to fight for that gut feeling because I think one of the worst things, speaking to a lot of people who are many years older than me, they say, you know, the, the second they really started extinguishing that voice is the second they started having something called regret. So now let's talk about, we're done, we're done with the, the football. Yep. Definitely not done with the athletics. No. Um, like I said, CrossFit, that's, that's something that's pretty, pretty new yep. now, right? Let's talk about your professional career. So was it straight from football? To Dell, or how did how did that work? So, there was two jobs before I got to uh, EMC, which is now Dell EMC. We're required. Um, the first was a financial coordinator inside the IT department of Children's Place, and then I went over to uh, Dish Network Satellite Television, uh, doing inside sales, which is kind of where I got a feel for um, what the sales process was and how my skills translated naturally to a business development role, a sales role, an account manager role. Um, and then that's where I got the opportunity from Joe to go up to Boston, uh, work for EMC and, and, and do two years in a training program and then come down to uh, work in a territory in New York or New Jersey. So why do you think that was such a fit for you comparative to the, the other two positions you had? I think EMC had a, had a good culture that, that, that I really fit well in. Number one, the, there is a very assertive uh, and business development oriented sales culture. Um, number two, they, they foster a very entrepreneurial spirit and so they give you a lot of flexibility and a lot of independence to run your business the way you see fit, um, which fits into, into my personality a lot um, as opposed to sort of uh, a larger framework and, and strict guidelines of how to do things. It's very, very um, entrepreneurial, which is, a, which is a good fit for me. So you like the freedom? Yeah, and I need the freedom to, do, to, to work. That's just my personality. So well, let's talk a little bit about so some of the people that we've had on before have had a corporate job or they're in that transition phase and they start talking about how they want to make the jump, right? Mm -hmm. 
but one of the big reasons why I wanted to have you on and have a conversation is because you, you fit a lot of pieces into your life. So we have the work piece, right? The quote unquote corporate piece, but you also do CrossFit. How do you fit that into your everyday life? Yeah, so CrossFit uh, satisfies, uh, checks a lot of boxes for me. Number one, it keeps me healthy, um, keeps my body healthy, gives me a lot of energy. Um, but it also fosters a, a unique component with my wife. My wife is very into CrossFit as well. Um, so we do that together a lot of times, or if not, we just compare workouts, we compare you know scores, we compare weights, etc. So it keeps us together as well. Um, but it satisfies the competitive nature that I had from being a, an athlete. Uh, you know, as an athlete, as you know, you're always looking to compete, you're always looking to self-improve, you're always looking to, to, to engage physically in something. And so you know, when you go from you go cold turkey on on, uh, on my athletic career, you sort of look for that outlet to express yourself in that way, and CrossFit satisfies that 100%. So it is my workout um, three or four days a week, um, and I do supplement that with some yoga, some running, some stretching, and things like that. But for the most part, that's the crux of what both my wife and I do from, from the exercise perspective. So CrossFit for some people may be intimidated by, right? Yeah. If somebody wanted to learn more, actually go take a class, or is the best, what's the best way to look more into CrossFit. Every, every CrossFit go to, box go to, go to one get, the gyms? Yeah, they'll offer you a free workout. Go get a feel for it. Um, put your toe in the water. You know, get uncomfortable. And, and actually, you'll feel the energy that, that will carry you throughout uh, the life of, of, your, of, your, of your exercise life. So we got the work piece. We have the, the body piece, right? Physical health. Mm -hmm. Making sure that you're maintaining and uh, obviously progressing how yep. you want to. Staying physically fit. So now let's bring the other piece in, which is kayak. And again, the reason I really wanted you here was, was to really be able to speak to the fact that you still have this corporate position, you work out almost every single day, you're staying physically fit, you're staying mentally sharp, but now you've actually stepped out and helped out the community, right? Because we've talked about this before, how CrossFit is also a community as well. Work, I know there's that community camaraderie in terms of fellow people that you work with. So now Kaye. Where does that come from, and and how how are you managing all those pieces? Yeah, so so Gaia, the Cuban American Alliance for Leadership and Education, um, is born from a simple concept, and that is that you do not have to wait until you are retired, million or billionaire or anything heir to give back to your community. That you can do it right now, and that you should do it right now, and that your time is equally as valuable as it is now, as when is when you're retired and you're a millionaire or not. Right. So, the concept of waiting to give back or giving back later, or how do you carve out your own personal time is something I personally addressed within in my own life, right? So I don't watch you know, Game of Thrones or any other TV show or any you know, special that's going on, just completely out of that world. And I dedicate those time, those cycles, those hours to building this nonprofit that I've built, which is that along with a great team. So I, 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 let me just apologize for saying I built. We, we built, I didn't build anything. Um, and so, Instead of coming home and Facebooking, watching TV, sitting around, um, being lazy, I'd say, I'd say make sure you're giving back to the community now, not waiting. And so that's what Gaia is. Gaia is the project that myself um, and uh, four other uh, young Cuban-American professionals have put together to help um, support education within our community. So what does that mean? That's a very broad statement, right? Supporting education. Well, number one is, the mission is three, has three components to it, three pillars. The first is merit-based scholarship. So we're giving hard currency to, child, to, to high school students going to college. This year, we're giving uh, three $10,000 scholarships for students going into freshman year of college, right? So merit-based college scholarship where they've applied via essay, via video, um, via letters of recommendation um, to apply for these scholarships, and we've awarded 10, 000, three $10,000 scholarships. We're very proud of that. Um, the second piece is a leadership development program. So while hard currency is addressing a very major issue within our country today, I think, or any modern society, especially the United States, which is exorbitant uh, education costs, tuition costs, and subsequently leaving kids with six-figure um, student loans to pay off, we're going beyond that, right? I think that's very important, but we're going beyond that. I think leadership development is even more paramount in modern society. So what we're created is a leadership development program that does a series of things. Number one, it assigns a mentor to each student that carries along through the life cycle of their college career. So they're uh, meeting with a mentor at least twice a year, at least twice a year. Second thing is we've created modules, right? Learning-based, skill-based, habit-based modules um, that we've programmed into 
the four years of their of their college career when they're home from breaks when they're here in the summertime to go through things as the following so financial freedom right how to build your way to your financial freedom how to manage your personal finances um, number two public speaking communication course We're having a professional um, public speaking coach come in and go through half hour uh, I'm sorry half a day work full day workshop with these folks to help them communicate better help them be better leaders uh, number three, emotional intelligence, right? So taking an, uh, an assessment like Myers-Briggs, DISC assessment, so that they can get to know their own strengths and weaknesses and how those, those... personality tests, right? Yeah, yeah, personality assessments. So they can understand how those strengths and weaknesses best apply to uh, their coworkers, their colleagues, their close students, whoever it is um, in whatever environment it is. So we're trying to develop the skills and habits to make better leaders. The second two components are, I'm sorry, the number three and four are exposure based. So we want kids to get exposure. So we take them on number one, site visits to companies like Google, Facebook in the city, the New, the New Jersey government state house, Verizon, places where they can see outside of um, what they may have been brought up in our, in our you know, community, um, just so they can get exposure to different companies and different, um, different industries. The fourth is uh, leadership series. So we've brought leaders in from those various companies from the community to give us their story. Folks, for example, have been uh, the CMO, Chief Marketing Officer of Facebook, who reports directly to Mark Zuckerberg, was gracious enough to give us an hour of his time, um, his story, best practices, how he got there, um, and then answer a question and uh, do a Q&A session afterwards. And so for a high school student, for a college student, it's amazing who has no exposure to these, folk, these types of leaders, it's amazing exposure, right? Um, another one has been a US Congressman. So m mentors, modules, site visits, leadership series, and the final is required reading that are books that are not in traditional academic setting, but nonetheless we feel are paramount to any, any future leader's success. Things like How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, things like Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, and Emotional Intelligence, right, uh, Daniel Goldman. Um, books like that that we think are fostering skills and habits that aren't being taught in traditional academia. So that's, that's what encompasses leadership, the LDP, Leadership Development Program. So we have your uh, merit-based scholarship, leadership development program and we have cultural education where um, we require the students to minor in Spanish right one of the staples of, of Cuban culture is the language Spanish language um, we're doing a workshop on Cuban history um, we're injecting other way we're, we're finding other ways to inject Cuban culture um, within this program so that when these folks do receive hard currency for, for education when they do receive leadership development skills habits and exposure they're doing it um, and they're maintaining grounded in their roots, uh, both culturally um, and their family it's roots as well. It's a full curriculum. It's a full curriculum. We think it's a worthy cause. We think there's leadership lacking in this world, and we think kids need money for scholarships. So we're just putting it all together and, and, and building it. So that was a couple steps ahead. Now let's back it up a couple bit. Uh, yep. A couple steps. We're, we're all about making things actionable here, and, and that that area of focus that I think is so important for people is understanding, like, okay, how did it go from like idea, right? to what was that first step to actually turn that idea into action? I think the first step was assembling a team. So it started with the leadership of one person actually thinking we should do something, that we should give back, we should carve out some of our time to give back to our community in some form or fashion, whether it's starting your own or contributing to another one, just giving your time back, so deciding you're gonna do it, developing a team around you, if it turns out that you're gonna go the direction of starting your own, um, I'm of the methodology that if you want to run fast, run alone. If you want to run far, assemble a good team and run together. So that's what we did. So first step was assembling a team. Uh, second step was very tactical. It was who in the team could get us to 501c3 status. One of our team members happened to be a lawyer. We contacted the free legal counsel of his university and they volunteered to do the project for us, which was get us our 501c3 status. So all donations we accept are tax exempt from the donor, which is a big benefit, right? Sure. Gives people more incentive to give to our, our organization. Um, so we're very thankful for our sponsors who have helped us give these three ten thousand dollars scholarships, right? That's a big dollar amount in the grand scheme of things, especially for a, a three-year-old non-startup to give thirty thousand dollars in scholarships for kids. Sure. It's impactful, so we're proud of that. So to answer the question, the first step is the idea, the leadership, assembling the team, and then just taking the concrete steps that make you, it. Use the available resources. Use the available resources. Don't worry resources. about what you don't have. Figure we're, out what you do have, and then utilize those. Start running. That's just awesome. Just start running. That's awesome advice, man. Appreciate that. So now we've taken the first steps. We've turned it into something. We have the entire curriculum. What does the future hold for Adam San Miguel, Calle, and all Life. that good stuff? Yeah. Um, so for Calle, we want to grow the program. Uh, we want to make sure 
we've taken someone from graduating high school senior and we've converted them from student to successful young professional, right? Young leader. Um, what does that look like? Again, money for scholarships, LDP, leadership development program, and a culturally grounded individual. Um, we want to expand that program to more than just Cuban in the future, right? Right now, funds dictate that we can only give a certain amount of scholarships each year. We'd love to grow that. We'd love to grow that. So, so for one, we want to grow the program, grow our sponsorship base, our donor base, um, expand what we can offer more than just the, the two or, th or, or four things that we've put together. Uh, but for me personally, I don't know yet. And I think we've talked about this before. I don't know what the next three years holds for me. I have to decide that soon. And it's, it's, it's my focus for the next rest of the year, what I'm trying to do. But while I figure that out, I've decided I just want to be extremely successful at what I'm doing now. So right now I'm managing um, at a professional level the New Jersey public sector practice for Dell EMC, which consists of state, local government, education. I work with all those folks in New Jersey. Um, Calle, I'm dedicated to these students. They, 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 they truly inspire me. Forget about the program and the money, this and that. When you sit with one of these sure. kids that we've chosen to be part of this program, you'll see the talent level, the, the level of grind, the level of desire, the, the, the level of desire to, to, to achieve and really give back to their own community. It truly inspires you. So forget my little story. If you really want to be moved, sit with one of these individuals and hear their story. I'll send you one of the videos. Just fantastic individuals that I can't wait to help. Sincerely, <laughs> you can't wait to help. So. What that holds in five to 10, I don't know, but I'm gonna figure it out, I'm sure it'll be a part of it. We'll keep your viewers posted, um, and hopefully we're helping people along the way. So, with that being said, this is usually a time where I'm gonna kick it over to you. Yep. And I'd really like you to speak to everyone, and if, if there's something we really love, like we've said it time and time again, it's making things actionable. Yep. So, I guess, do you have a, a life motto, or is there, is there, are there principles that you follow that you can give them that maybe can help them along their path. Yep, I do. So I was given um, I was given the opportunity to speak at a high school. I want to say a couple of years ago, um, just motivational speaking, similar to this. What's your story? Why are you doing it? How'd you get there, etc. Um, and so to do that, I developed a, like a three a three tiered uh, approach, which is just three W's. And so that's that's the methodology that's helped me convert from being a successful athlete to now a successful young well, professional. Let's tell them the three W's. Yeah, so the three W's, number one, uh, the first is uh, work like hell, right? So do not let laziness rob you of your vision. I think, I think it's ideas are, are the commodity. I think what's special is the execution of that. So whenever something comes to your mind, a good cause, something small, doing something for your wife, your family, for the community, just do it. Do it and work like hell. There's a lot of talented folks out there, but nothing beats hard work, nothing beats the sacrifice, nothing beats the grit and the sweat equity you can put into anything you do. Um, I think any successful person will tell you that, right? Michael Jordan's Michael Jordan, not because he's the most talented, but he worked the hardest. There's a thousand other stories like that. So just follow those stories and find what you want to do and work like hell. That's the first one, work like hell. Uh, the second one is watch film. So. You know, this concept uh, in football that we used to watch our practices, watch our games, break down our mistakes, uh, pat ourselves on the back where we did something well, is a concept that I've had to learn how to transition into um, sort of post-athletic life, right? When there's no game, when there's no whistle being blown, what film are you watching? Are you watching a film or does that just get wiped in the past? I remember when we used to watch a film. Uh, the answer is no, right? So this right here, we're filming ourselves. We can, we can go ahead and back and watch that and see how I spoke, see how my filler words, did I use any? Um, did I, how was my eye contact? That's on the very tactical level. On a philosophical level, you can take that film aspect and say, how can I watch film of something that's not being filmed, right, without a physical device? Let's think about that for a second. Meditation, right? Reflection. Can you come out of a meeting, a conversation, an event, and replay in your head what you said, what they said, who said what, and judge, wait, maybe I, was I listening to that person? Did I say that thing right? Did I stutter there? Did I, something. The point is you, you need to self-reflect and meditate on your thoughts, on your life, on your action, and that's the way you watch film. So you're continuously improving yourself, um, whether on or off the field, right? In this case, off. So watch film is the second W. And the third W is what's your why? This one, you know, I've taken from, I think it was Eric Thomas who said it. You gotta know why you're doing something. You gotta know why you're grinding. Because if you don't know why, at some point, you know, the tired, the sleep, you know, the weak, 
that stuff will catch up to you and you'll quit. So know why you're grinding. Is it your wife? Is it your mother? Is it your father? Is it your friends? Is it yourself? Is it your grandparents, someone who's deceased? Why are you here and why do you want to succeed? Know that and that passion will wake you up every single day, very early. Um, and so, so you apply those, those, those three W's to your everyday life and there's really no way you won't be successful. So to answer your question, the three W's is how I live my life. It's work like hell, watch film, and what's your why? First off, that was, that was killer. Three W's, I love Thank that. You. I might use that. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> Copyright. <laughs> Josh Schiller, <laughs> Ryan Sam No, 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 no. I'll give you I'll give you full credit. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for coming here. I mean, so my takeaway is very high level. Number one, don't let that inner voice or that inner gut get silenced by anyone around you, right? Fight for what you believe in. Number two, you don't have to be a an heir, and that could be a millionaire, a thousandaire, or a billionaire for that matter, to give back. Right. Right? Number three. You could have a corporate job, still give back, still work out, still do all these other things in life. You're not, it's not a, I, I can only do this it's if situation, or. right? You can, you can fit all these things in. And then number four is have guiding principles. And for you, it's the three W's, right? I would ask everybody else, you know, what are your guiding principles that you have a reason to wake up for every day? With that being said, thank you so much for coming here. Thank you for your time. I think that there's so much value to be had from your story and I guess the only thing left is there's two things but number one if anybody wanted to reach out to you what's the best way to get in contact with yeah, you? Facebook I'm sure you'll tag me on this um, so shoot me a message friend me whatever it is on Facebook I, f I usually follow you so um, I, I log into Facebook so they can reach me there if somebody's not a Facebooker do you have like an email they yeah could go yeah to? so it's simply so it's Adam .saint Miguel at gmail.com a d a m dot s-a-n-m-i-g-u-e-l at gmail.com oh g-u-e-l yeah g-u-e-l san okay. miguel and then calle dot calle.org calle.org c-a-a-l-e dot org c-a-a-l-e yep. dot org so calle the word in spanish for street is two l's one a we're the opposite we have two a's one l but we pronounce it like calle a little as bit I said of spice, before yeah. Yeah, a little bit of sazon like you said thank you yeah and there's only one more thing to do what is it? Have a great day, man. You too, man. Thank you.